Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Advances in Primary Below Grade Waterproofing. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of today's session, time permitting, or via email after. And you can always send questions to mapedigital at mape.com. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, John Lucas. John is the business development leader, building envelope systems waterproofing for MAPE. He has over 25 years experience within the construction industry in the fields of waterproofing, manufacturing, chemical coatings, architectural coatings, and high performance coatings, as well as in new product development and technical support. While at MAPE, he has trained thousands of American, Canadian, and international end users, inspectors, and consultants on waterproofing, insulation, and air and vapor barrier membrane installation methods. He has also developed installation instructions and technical documents for both existing and newly developed products. He has advised design professionals in project-specific membrane applications, and he has created CAD drawings to reflect those specific conditions. John has a BBA in accounting and BAs in biology and chemistry from Baylor University in Waco, Texas, and an MBA from Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. And with that, I welcome him to the microphone. John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> John Lucas here. I hope everyone is uh, doing well and safe. Uh, today, we're going to talk through uh, some uh, advances in uh, waterproofing. Uh, but before I get going, uh, as far as talking about the advances, um, I wanted to kind of, I don't know, apologize for the wordiness of this presentation, per se. Uh, there's a lot of information, and I wanted to cover as much as I possibly could. Uh, therefore, some of the pictures kind of had to go. So with that, uh, kind of review the outline that we had uh, we've published before, uh, the who, what, where, when, and why of waterproofing, uh, as well as uh, we're going to talk about some guidelines for proper waterproofing design, MAPE's products in the primary waterproofing, technical support that uh, MAPE provides uh, to that end to make sure that we have this uh, proper waterproofing design and proper waterproofing products all lined up together. And at the very end, I kind of want to make a, <clears throat> one of my little favorite little details kind of come alive for you. Uh, we'll walk through some of the things that we've even talked about previously in this presentation. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, why are we waterproofing? Well, let me tell you, they, they, it, we can all read the slide real well, but the consequences of not waterproofing are huge, uh, whether they're dispute costs, legal fees, uh, damage to uh, uh, stored goods, archives, um, business disruption because the the equipment we had in the waterproof in the basement that needed waterproofing is now compromised, uh, loss of rent, reduction in uh, property value, damage to the reputation of not only the landlord, developer, uh, general contractor, but even the architect and the, even the installer. So this is why we waterproof. Um, understanding too that uh, there is an unavoidable cost uh, if you have mold and mildew or you have a space that has a lot of water intrusion. Uh, it For every dollar it costs for you to build the building, it's going to take you 10 to fix it. That's why we waterproof. In waterproofing, uh, you know, in the in the title it says uh, below grade waterproofing. Uh, as primary waterproofing, uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear here. Uh, primary waterproofing doesn't always mean below grade waterproofing. Primary waterproofing has uh, everything to do with uh, uh, the below grade waterproofing structures, but also above grade structural assemblies, especially those over occupied spaces or spaces that you don't want to have water come into them. These are some examples of them, mainly their decks. 
balconies. On the interior side, you're looking at uh, uh, wet rooms or other rooms that uh, require quite a bit of uh, water. Um, or if they have a failure in that area, it will cause water intrusion in other areas of the building. And so those areas need to be waterproofed. So again, structural waterproofing is what we're talking about, not necessarily always below grade. So question usually I get is, so if, what's, so if we have primary, we probably have a secondary, right? So if we have a one, we normally have a two. Well, you're exactly right. We do have a secondary waterproofing. I want to kind of make uh, a, the distinction between the two. One, it has to do with function, and two, what are you protecting? So let's talk about that real quick. Primary waterproofs or protects the structure, whether it's below grade walls or above grade decks over occupied space. Secondary waterproofing does not. Secondary waterproofing protects a part of a system, whether that be a mortar, an adhesive, or even a, a finished material. That is the primary differences, no pun intended, uh, between the two. Um, I can assure you of something, uh, that if you use secondary products, secondary waterproofing products, where you should have used primary, um, you will uh, you'll get sued, certainly get sued. Um, there is uh, this other thing in uh, the Division 7 of the CSI uh, specification guide called uh, uh, damp proofing. Uh, isn't that really just another form of waterproofing? That's a very common question I get. Um, I would tell you that it's not, but I want to also kind of cover, you know, if you're going to use it, where is it appropriate and where it's not? So don't, we have to get started. Somewhere, let's start about start through a couple of definitions. ASTM, uh, it is not another stupid testing method. <laughs> it's a joke. It's American Standard Testing Methods will tell you, and they define waterproofing as a preventing. It prevents water under pressure. Prevents. Damp proofing does not. Damp proofing resists, so it does allow water, but it only resists in the absence of water pressure. It slows it down. It doesn't prevent it. Waterproofing does. Another key distinction between damp proofing and waterproofing is damp proofing does not bridge post-applied cracks in the substrate or in the concrete. It doesn't do that. There's not a, physically, there's not enough material for it to do that. And if it does bridge it and somehow maintains its integrity, it's too thin to work. It's a matter of physics. So those are the big two dis distinctions. Waterproofing prevents, damp proofing doesn't. Waterproofing bridges, damp proofing doesn't. It, if you want to boil it down to something, if the owner of the building wants a damp wall, Use damp proofing by all means, please. But if the owner has a very low tolerance for water in their building, uh, waterproofing would be the, uh, the 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 way to go. I want to kind of drill and uh, take. You know, what does this look like? Drill a little deeper here. On the left is your damp proofing wall assembly. There's a wall with a uh, uh, concrete slab. Uh, that little circle is a drain pipe. And down below all that structural assembly, guess what? That's the water table. That's where the water table level is. Okay, so it's significantly below where the damp proofing is, has been applied. If you look over on the right, that's the waterproofing. The red line all the way around underneath the slab. Um, through that angle change, perhaps not. Um, probably around the footer would be a better application, but uh, this is a, a nice little kind of quick way to look at it. Uh, the water table you can see goes about one third up the wall. And then there's this uh, thing called capillary action. Capillary action is uh, so uh, soils above the water uh, table. They have all soils have capillaries. Actually, concrete does, too. Uh, and that's where water can absorb into that uh, uh, overburdened soil. Uh, soil above the water level, and it can move up the wall as much as 10 feet, depending on the type of soil. 
So uh, over on the back over on the left, if that water table level was say a little higher, probably damp proofing would not be uh, a very good uh, choice for that type of building because it's too close to that water table. Now back on the the um, the definition piece of the previous slide, we talked a little bit about uh, water pressure. Uh, this is called hydrostatic pressure in the uh, waterproofing communities. Um, we certainly uh, uh, want to kind of kind of drill a little deeper on this one. Hydro meaning water, static meaning still, hydrostatic pressure. So that's basically if you put a one inch square, one inch wide, one inch long, uh, wide to, uh, one inch square wide, and you were to put it 10 feet in uh, a, a container 10 feet high down at the very bottom, the pressure of the water would be 19 pounds per square inch. So if the water table were 10 feet high against a one story building beneath, uh, in, beneath the grade, then the, the, the water, if, the, if there was no other added pressure from an adjacent water table, you would have 19 PSI uh, water pressure on that wall. If the same building were to go two floors, it's 24 PSI. If you were to take it a third floor down into the grade, like a lot of parking garages are, are put below the grade, the waterproofing is going to have 28 pounds per square inch of water pressure on it. Those figures do not include other uh, sources of water pressure, which would be uh, uh, elevated uh, areas draining into it. Also, there is this concept and uh, a couple of buildings I've had experience where they actually built the, built the building into an underground river. So these pressures aren't uh, um, included. Now, back to the definitions. Why is hydrostatic pressure so important? Well, sheet applied waterproofing can withstand 100 PSI of water pressure. Three stories, not a problem. Hey, let's put a river nearby. Perfect. Let's do that too. We got plenty of PSI to play with. The hydrostatic resistance of damp proofing is at the most, if it's properly applied, is five PSI of water pressure. So you can see if we have any type of water pressure, hydrostatic pressure, damp proofing is not repeat not the way to go. That's why that was important. So uh, that's the, the, let's see, how does water come in, right? Um, water is a crazy thing. It, it takes the path of least resistance, but where does it come from? Uh, we talked about the hydrostatic uh, pressure. We just have a little slide on the water table. That's one of the sources. Other is site drainage or inadequate site drainage. Surface water, anywhere from uh, a rainstorm uh, uh, improperly uh, directing sprinklers to snow melt. Uh, we talked about the capillary rise in soils, but uh, other places and how, uh, where it would uh, come from to enter a foundation would be there's a big water main break nearby the building. Maybe we had an improper waterproofing detail right near that break. And maybe there was, uh, you know, no waterproofing at all. And uh, guess what? Or maybe we just had damp proofing there and some uh, cracks and maybe some joint movement. And uh, that's how we get water into our building. Where does it enter? Uh, you know, this is the wear piece of it. So, uh, you know, it enters in through all these cracks. Uh, it could be a, a sump pit that has no water pit proofing in it, kind of was an afterthought. It could have pipe penetrations or fenestrations that are not even detailed because the waterproofing guy was gone, installer was gone, and they came and drilled a hole in to, to bring in city services into the building. Uh, those happen. Uh, movement, excessive movement of uh, joints that are, are not designed to move, uh, as well as uh, you know cracks, and then floor to wall joints that have opened up. But all that, uh, the most common, uh, according to the statistics, are is that one over on the lower right, the plug drain tile. Now the plug drain tile, what happens is it gets, it gets damaged. If you can imagine it's a four inch pipe perforated or a six inch pipe, depending on what the geotech uh, and the uh, hydrologist indicates that is necessary for the water management, it gets plugged up or most commonly it gets damaged. Damaged first, then plugged. 
And then so what happens is the water starts to accumulate because it's not going anywhere. It's not draining. So it goes over the top of the water pavilion. It, it accumulates on that wall, rises the wall. So yes, water does go uphill. And the path of least resist resistance is where the below grade waterproofing is not connected to the wall uh, through a, like a through wall flashing, or there is no ability to connect it. And so that's another common, that's probably the most common way is that there's no waterproofing in that area because it wasn't anticipated that that drain tile or that drain pipe would get broken. So that's the where, why, and how of waterproofing. Let's talk about the what part of it. So, hey, what's uh, what are some characteristics? I believe these are all important, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I like to kind of distill things down. Uh, that's a one. That's very important. Continuous. It's got to be there. It's got to be all connected. We just can't have it on one corner and, and not uh, do it on the whole entire wall that, to connect the corners. It's got to be a complete system. Uh, just having the waterproofing membrane doesn't make it waterproof. There actually are, are, are different parts to a complete system. And then the last is I call it constant. It has to be uh, robust and durable enough to laugh, last the life of the, the, the uh, building. Understanding that waterproofing is designed for the life of the building. That's what it's designed for. If it fails, you can't very well lift the building up and replace the waterproofing. You can excavate, but that's very, very costly. But if you're in New York City, Chicago, downtown, San Fran downtown, all these downtown locations in cities, I'm sorry, there's no place to excavate because it's the next building, the building is next to you. So these products are designed for the life of the building. So all of them are effective, all of them need to be done, but the three, continuous, complete, and constant. Now, how do you do that? Well, there's a concept in building uh, science, uh, relatively new, uh, well, maybe 20 years, 30 years old. It's called um, system modularization. And the concept is, is, is any system contains layers and each layer contributes to the longevity or the, the, the long functioning aspect of the system. In waterproofing, we'll break it down into three layers and then I'm gonna kind of discuss one other layer that is used quite a bit in the whole entire system and where it fits in too. So let's go through the big three. Surface prep and primer layer. Some products, some uh, waterproofing membranes require primer. We'll put it all in one layer. What's the function here? Repairs and prepares. The surface so that you know we have a squared away smooth uh, don't have too many bug holes that type of uh, those type of defects in the uh, surface and the other thing too is we deploy sealants uh, detailing membranes detailing strips of membrane to take care of the the penetrations the fenestrations and the angle changes the inside and outside corners the wall to, to footing uh, wall to slab um, uh, angle changes, any angle changes that happen in the waterproofing layer, if there's a thick and slabbed area on the blind side, for instance, uh, we'll wanna make sure that that area is, is reinforced so that we're continuous, right? And we're complete. So the next, uh, so we're all squared away, so it's time to put the waterproofing in. And we already know what the water, I've talked about this, we already know what the waterproofing does, it, it prevents water and it bridges post applied cracks, it's pretty simple. Okay, the next part of it is we gotta protect it, uh, and drain it. So we're going to protect the membrane from damage by others. I'll show you a picture uh, that illustrates damage by others. And then uh, we're also going to tell uh, water exactly where to go. That's what the drain board does. Now all of these things are very, very important and they all have a function. Uh, system modularization does include an additional layer called an insulation layer. The insulation layer, of course, insulates the building and, and thermally isolates it from the environment below grade environment uh, here or the above grade and the depths. It just thermally isolates it. Where does it go? Typically it goes right on top of the waterproofing or on top of the drain board for above grade um, applications. But below grade insulation when it gets wet doesn't work as well as when it's dry. So you kind of want to put it next to the waterproofing and we'll have the drain board in, in front of it to try and keep it uh, as dry as possible. 
so that's kind of in a nutshell with system modularization. Now, system modularization, again, this is how we do it successfully. So that's kind of the, the system piece of it. Uh, let's kind of talk about the, the waterproofing layer, the, the, the categories of membranes that are out there. There's three, just, uh, you know, spoiler alert, three of them. Uh, sh the sheet applied, uh, waterproofing, contains an adhesive and then usually a backer of uh, one uh, form of plastic, either high density polyethylene flat plastic or uh, uh, TPO, FPO or PVC. Again, other forms of plastics are very durable, uh, very uh, uh, resistant to uh, hydrostatic head. Uh, and also, they're, they're, because they're made in a, a manufacturing facility, they're of consistent thickness. The next category, broad categories, is cold, uh, I mean, uh, fluid applied. Comes in two varieties, cold and hot. Hot and cold, right? Uh, the hot is, uh, comes in uh, uh, boxes, uh, cured material. And all you do is melt it and melt it at about uh, two to 300 degrees, pour it out onto the deck. And as soon as the uh, uh, waterproofing uh, cools off, it's ready to go. Cold fluid applied, uh, a little bit different. They come uh, in two varieties, uh, one part or two parts. Most of them, most of the most popular are based on polyurethanes, just, you know, either urethane modified or uh, urethanes by, by, by and large by themselves. One parts, uh, the two parts came first in the waterproofing membrane, and then the one parts came later. And now we're coming full circle back uh, on the meth methacrylates. But uh, for the one parts, they, the other part basically is moisture. They cure it, uh, or they react to the uh, polyethers. And then the, on the two parts, they have uh, a catalyst and a base component, um, and they uh, uh, isocyanurate uh, is usually the catalyst or they use uh, um, polyurethane modified acrylic, which is your meth methacrylates. Uh, some of the meth methacrylates can be three parts, including the solvent. So a little bit more complicated on the two parts. Therefore, the, uh, I think we can, all agree, uh, we can all guess that the moisture cureds uh, and the moisture reactives are the most popular because they're, they're pretty simple to use. Real easy to, to, uh, to apply relatively. Um, if you've ever hung wallpaper uh, versus painted a wall, I think we can all agree that uh, uh, painting the wall is a lot easier than hanging wallpaper. That's where the ease of application comes from. Monolithic means that uh, in the sheet applied, uh, there are seams. And so this is a seamless monolithic uh, waterproofing layer. The last one is a geotextile. Uh, one of the older ones of the group, it actually is the older one of the group. Um, <clears throat> sodium bentonite clay. Uh, volcanic ash swells really well. Um, very easy to install. It's like hanging carpet on a wall um, or putting it down on the ground and then we'll pour, con we'll pour concrete right to it. Um, if it does get damaged, a lot of times it's very damage tolerant um, and it can actually, I don't call it self-healing, but it that's what they call it, self-healing. It just basically seals. If you were to put a fastener or a nail through it, it actually will seal uh, swell uh, shut around that uh, uh, fastener, as long as you don't pull it back out. And even if you pull it back out, it'll swell shut anyway because it, it swells very well. So those are the categories. So let's uh, let's 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 marry the applications and the categories. Um, if you'll note, we're going to waterproof first. We'll waterproof the uh, the site, the actual job site. We'll waterproof the job site. Then we'll build the building on top of the waterproofing. Yeah. Uh, and it's done all day long. Uh, we, it's deployed with uh, sodium bentonite clay uh, membranes as well as uh, pre-applied sheets, whether they are um, hybrid or otherwise. And uh, next, if we have the building already built and we need still have a couple of walls we need to waterproof, we'll waterproof the outside of the building. Hey, we can use sodium bentonite clay too. It's a com see com saw waterproofing. It can be used uh, blind side as well as positive side. Uh, and again, the other forms of waterproofing are there. Uh, I went ahead and threw in cementitious waterproofing or capillary breaking waterproofing. Uh, it is now in thicknesses and modifications that it has, uh, um, it can bridge the post applied cracks and still withstand the high uh, pressures of uh, waterproofing area. The last one is what I call the oops. This is the oops waterproofing. Uh, we built the building, and it leaks. So we got to go in and 
and actually fix it, or uh, maybe it's designed this way in an elevator pit to uh, <clears throat> to do that, um, or areas where we didn't think that the water table was so high, and that's deployed with the crystalline type waterproofing and the, the cementitious as well from above. Um, again, the negative and positive, I'll, I'll dig a little deeper into that, and I'll actually, we'll include uh, the blind side as well. We'll kind of walk through real quickly and throw you, uh, show you some pictures. Not so many words anymore. Okay, so we're going to build another building just like the other two in the background. That was fun. Let's try that. Uh, so we're going to uh, excavate out, put our drain board. That's the way that little arrow goes. And then the circle comes in, and that's our uh, uh, waterproofing membrane be, being installed on, on uh, starting to be installed on the wall. What the gentlemen in the foreground and the background are walking on, they're walking on rebar, and rebar. And when they're not walking on the rebar, they're walking on a, a waterproofing membrane, the waterproofing membrane that's being put up on the wall. So you can see this durability, right? Constructability, robust. This is what I mean by that. It has to be robust enough to, to have uh, basically rebar dragged on it and placed on it and people walking on it. Very, very important for that to happen. That's why the, a lot of times the bentonite clays work out real well because you don't typically have to repair them unless they're destroyed. So the uh, goal of a blindside wall, we're going to make this mess. We're going we're gonna to turn this thing into a waterproofing substrate. You got your rakers. Uh, looks like some whalers there, some exterior bracing, some wells. We're going to have to uh, have our system, number one, be continuous. Number two is we're going to have to put drain board, deploy drain board. Looks like we're going to have some lumber to smooth it all out. What you're looking at in the, on the right side of the photo, the wall, those are called secant piles. And they drill those in ahead of time and then they'll excavate. And over on the right, which is unusual to see, is a, a sheet pile. So that must be an existing building next door that has the sheet piles next to it. So we have two different types of substrates. I'm gonna throw in a third blind side wall to really uh, mix it all up. Uh, this is the uh, lag wall. Uh, if you look at the numbering system, it's number one. It's the one with the lumber. Um, this is called a front lag, where the lumber is placed in the front. Those orange little squares all over the place are soil stabilization nails, uh, lovingly called tiebacks. Um, they tie the soil to the, the back of the wall and keep everything squared away. So that's your substrates number one. Uh, you'll prepare that if the gaps between the lumber are, are, are more than two and a half inches, typically they grout them. Um, if there's any other type of protrusions, they're, they're, they're nipped away. Excess uh, 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 screw heads are nip, nipped away. Then we put the drain board, that's the number two, that's the black piece right there, polypropylene and polystyrene and used in uh, drain boards are, are black. And then over here, the white is, uh, it looks like clay. That's a, yeah, it's a clay membrane being hung on the wall on top of it. So there you go. Substrate, drain board, membrane. Um, please understand, you know, blind side waterproofing is positive side waterproofing backwards. It's not waterproofing membrane or prep it, waterproofing membrane, drain it like I had give you the sequence before. Blind side's slightly different in that we're, we're building it backwards to create this type of system where you have the drain board on the left and you have your, your membrane and then you pour the concrete onto the membrane. The arrow for the protection board is it's protecting it uh, above the drain board. Positive water pressure exerts against the drain board, which exerts positive pressure against the um, Membrane at the seams. Under slab waterproofing, same thing. This is why they call it positive side waterproofing. Positive side waterproofing, kind of the arrows here, it's, it's, it resists the hydrostatic, it's continuous, and it can handle these transitions really, really easily. Uh, the one thing that uh, uh, to distinguish it from negative side, there are some negatives to negative side uh, waterproofing, no pun intended. Um, if you ever talk to me very much on the phone, you'll note that I don't like negative side waterproofing at all because um, water is is in the walls. 
So the water comes through the walls to the waterproofing. Um, so it's on the negative side, so it's negative pressure. It's constant negative pressure. What's in the walls, I wonder? Well, we got concrete, right? Uh, usually there's air with the concrete. And the other thing too is we reinforce it with that rebar stuff that we had looked at before on that blind side. That's actually in the walls too for structural uh, support. Strength, apologize. So what happens when we put water, iron, and air together? Well, you get rust. And rust is not as strong as iron. So that's kind of what happens over the long term. Probably not the best idea. I'll let structural engineers tell me that it, that's a great idea. I don't think they will. It's a horrible idea, but it's done quite a bit. Uh, this is kind of looks like an elevator pit. To me, the best elevator pit is a blindside waterproofing under the slab. A, uh, they'll pour the wall in place. We'll put the positive side waterproofing on the outboard side, and then let's go ahead and belt and suspender it in there with some negative sides. So let's use all three in one application. I'll guarantee you that elevator pit will be dry, as well as putting water stops in that uh, um, in there. Uh, that's my two cents on elevator pits and negative side waterproofing. Um, again, it's the whoops waterproofing. Where are we going from here? Uh, that's basically history and now, and the future looks like meth meth acrylate is because fast track construction, the use and deployment of uh, uh, meth meth acrylates uh, are increasing. Uh, understanding that meth meth acrylates have been around for um, 20 plus years, they call them now Puma, like, a, like the cat. Uh, they're polyurethane modified meth meth acrylates. Uh, uh, so they're basically um, only used, um, they have low permeability, so they're only used on uh, above grade structures like uh, your decks. Um, Another uh, increased, uh, uh, you know, where we're heading to is the green alternatives and not only in the adhesives, but the fillers as well. The fillers, uh, we're replacing the asphalt filler with uh, limestone derivatives. Uh, even glass beads are being used as well. And in the adhesives, uh, the asphalt is being removed and they have specialized uh, um, adhesives that are non asphaltic and they still have the. Uh, uh, similar water resistance of the asphalts, and they're increasing and getting better at, at full what's called for, full adhesion or surface wetting. And again, there's a this is a, a real common trend, especially in Southern California, um, is using two membrane. Hey, one membrane's good. Let's use two. So remember, there's three types of membranes. We've got your Sheet applied, your fluid applied. Hey, let's put those two together. Okay, so we'll put the fluid applied down. Sometimes we don't need a primer, sometimes we do, but nonetheless, we have that as our first layer. Then we put another, we put the peel and stick waterproofing right on top of it. Two is better than one. I get it. Uh, we can also take the uh, bentonite clay and put laminate the sheet waterproofing behind it. Okay, I get that too. Uh, we can also take the fluid, we can take the, I'm sorry, the, the bentonite. Uh, membrane geotextile membrane spray or, or roll on uh, the fluid applied. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by multiple membranes and that we're, we're seeing that quite a bit. The last is EFVM, electronic field vector mapping. It's kind of a, a uh, quality piece, piece where the, you know, the installer has indeed done exactly what he's said he was going to do and the owner is assured of that. They are now have progressed into permanent, so they can permanently test the uh, waterproofing uh, over the life of the building, uh, especially in green roofs. So it's really where the permanent uh, ones are deployed. All right, woo, man. Okay, that was the where, what, when, how, and why of waterproofing. Good night. Uh, let's talk about some uh, uh, guidelines, recommendations, best practices for, for on the design side. Um, at the end of the day, this is kind of what we're trying to shoot for. We're going to use some waterproofing techniques, materials, field practices, some analytics, as well as to find the sweet spot where everything's perfect, right? So where we can uh, use the membrane, uh, get take care of all the soils, get take care of the water, uh, low cost and, and, and high quality, low damage. Okay, how are we going to do that? 
Okay, that's the sweet spot. It all starts with the owner. Owner engages a uh, an architect. Those two get together and they, they, they try and marry the need and the architect. I mean, architect and design need, marry those two together and communicate that to a general contractor who hires a subcontractor or the general contractor will engage a manufacturer to bring everything together and hit the sweet spot. So, okay, how, how can, uh, you know, how can that all happen? Seems pretty complicated to me. I mean, two people have two different opinions. I can't imagine when you have four. So uh, let's talk about some best practices. Uh, this is the first one and most important. Got to talk, got to communicate, got to have a conference, got to talk. Who's going to be there? Who's invited to the party? Okay, well, it's a blind side wall. We got to talk to the ex excavation guy. If it's a, a building that we're building in the side of a mountain or the side of a hill, and we're going to we're going to carve out a piece of it and, and put our building there we got to talk to that guy or gal backfill so that's excavations before backfill is after so we went to division two division three is the surface requirements the requirements for the surface prep as well as the general requirements of the wall assemblies prior to waterproofing and then division seven handles this is uh the folks you might want to have the architect there you might want to have the general contractor there you might want to have all the trades that are available in there. And then if there's a waterproofing consultant, uh, we might want to have him or her on site as well for this conference. What are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about, hey, how can we successfully install waterproofing? And we're going to, as an architect or design team, they should be insisting on smooth monolithic substrates. Uh, a straight wall with no penetrations is perfect. It's a joke. Uh, and specify expanding water stops. Um, not exactly non-expanding water stops. Uh, a rhetorical question, what's the point? If water gets into a cold joint, whether it's the joint of a penetration and a, a wall hollowed out, uh, there has to be something there that when water hits it, it swells shut so that water doesn't come in anymore. Water stops are the suspenders to the belt that is waterproofing. And of course, Captain Obvious here, uh, let's follow the manufacturers. And so once we've selected that uh, um, membrane, then we need to make sure we follow those guidelines uh, as far as the type goes. So those are the best practices for design. Uh, so what's the critical path? Well, we have a couple of critical design factors. Um, you can hire a consultant, uh, perfectly uh, willing and able to take your money uh, to perform a risk assessment. All of these are very, very important, but boiling it down, I like to do that, distill it down, water, soil, timing, and how it's built. That's it. That's those your critical path and the use of the building. That's the critical design factors as part of a risk, risk assessment. Oh, which is the most important here? I'm glad you asked. The marrying the design intent with the owner's need and understanding that the owner's need's gonna change and we need to make sure we adapt to that change. So uh, what are some guidelines? Well, we, if you're going to select a primary waterproofing, these are a few suggestions. We've got to know our risk tolerance. Do we need to go with the, uh, the Uber, the best, uh, most expensive one, or will something uh, that's been around for a while work just fine and give what the owner once and maybe perhaps meets with the uh, occupancy type. Geotech report from uh, 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 very nice uh, uh, technical folks, uh, very bunch of good information there having to do with the uh, table soils and the soil stability or the substrate stability as well. Um, that will also help us uh, in the uh, technical department to recommend as well. This is also a good way to recommend stuff. Got to know about the timing and exposure. You know, again, this fast track construction will kind of knock out some products that uh, uh, require the substrate to be cured for 28 days. Well, if you ain't got 28 days, what's the point? We'll have to select another uh, membrane type or polymer. Also, if the uh, waterproofing is going to sit there for, for 30 days, are we okay with that? What if it sits for 60? Are we okay with that? And do we necessarily want our waterproofing installed and exposed to construction traffic for that long? 
talk about the product. Is it durable, robust enough to take that type of traffic, UV exposure? They're all a little different, and they all have different track records and different application sweet spots, so to speak. At the end of the day, what do we want? We want the lowest cost and the least risk. Yeah, good luck with that. But there is a trade-off, and those trade-offs can be had. And and some of the primary waterproofings, we can we can go in there and and take the risk down to nothing, but the cost is going to be probably pretty high for that. And understanding that relationship, if it's easier to install than something that's pretty complicated, or perhaps the installer that uh, everyone wants to use doesn't have the experience in this membrane, perhaps we want to switch switch to an easier applied, so we can get a more consistent application or installation. Finally, we got to make sure we we uh, uh, adhere to uh, local codes, local building codes, and we're not going to get that certificate of occupancy, which brings me, uh, we were talking about California a little earlier. California has a law that uh, any building with an elevator pit in it, um, you can't get a certificate of occupancy until that elevator pit is dry, bone dry. So uh, like I alluded to earlier, you might want to select all three. <laughs> Let's uh, use a blind side waterproofing. Let's use a positive side waterproofing and a negative side waterproofing and make sure we got those water stops in there to make sure that we can get the CO certificate of occupancy. Otherwise, you know, loss of reputation and all those other consequences. So that is uh, guidelines for proper waterproofing design. So what is, uh, uh, how does my pay fit in? Um, we'll walk through that real quickly. Here's all the types. Looks like we got something and everything. It's either going to start with a Mappy or it's going to start with a Plana. And we, we don't quite have the hot rubber yet. We're waiting for a piece of machinery, packaging machinery. We make it on the roofing side uh, all day long. Uh, and then crystalline waterproofing coming soon as well. Uh, it's in Europe. Uh, we'll bring it over across the Atlantic uh, soon. Uh, but anyway, it looks like we got most everything covered uh, as far as a type of waterproofing in a Mappe product. Dig a little deeper into them. Let's talk about mapathane. Mapathane is a self-adhered sheet membrane. Uh, Mapaproof is a sodium bentonite ge geotextile one. Planacil CR1 is cold rubber one. Just kind of want to translate some of the idiosyncrasies of some of the wording and, and names. Uh, CR1 cold rubber one, one component. Um, and then of course Mapa drain, which is our uh, drainage composite. Uh, moving more into more of the proprietary uh, products that we have uh, is MapProof ALNA. AL means adhesive layer, and NA means North America. Um, MapProof FBT is fully bonded uh, and taped membrane, so it's a hybrid membrane. I'll explain it a little later. And then Planacil CR2, I probably won't be discussing this anymore because it's, it is a membrane by itself. It's really used a lot in those combination membranes where you put this membrane down first and put the, the uh, Mapathane HT or the Mapathane LT on top of it, either one, it doesn't, work, it doesn't matter. Uh, but mainly it's used, it'll be used as a detailing membrane uh, for the Mapathane and the Mapaproof ALNA. Uh, so I'm, it's 100% solids, two-part aliphatic polyurethane. Um, and it works on horizontal as well as uh, vertical substrates applications. Oh, mapathane, uh, kind of a little bit, digging a little deeper into each one of these real quick. Uh, 60 mils, same as it ever was. Um, first invented in 1966 by a German company that Mappe owns. Mapathane HT, HT means high temperature, LT low temperature. There's the temperature ranges in the quotation areas, basically 40 and above is HT. Although, I mean, I've been around when it's 40, it's kind of chilly, but uh, anything below 60 is low temperature. Peel and stick, prime peel and stick. So this is the uh, sodium bentonite clay, uh, lovingly called a dirty piece of carpet, lovingly called a dirty piece of carpet. Uh, two pieces of fabric with the clay inside, stitched. HW means heavyweight. Uh, heavyweight because it's the, we have the most, 1.13 uh, pounds per square foot. Uh, the standards one were 1.13, 13% more. Uh, but most people don't meet the standard. So we're above the standard and most people are below it. Uh, map proof SW is for the uh, saltwater uh, contaminated uh, areas or if they're... 
if there's something in the water like a sulfate or a uh, phosphorus type uh, we would quote unquote call that a contaminant. It's just not swelling the way that we, we can, we want it to. And so we'll add a, a modified polymer to uh, modify the, the, the sodium bentonite to, to make sure it swells uh, the way we want it to, or it's supposed to. MAPA proof ALNA, again, adhesive layer uh, added to high density polyethylene. And then on top of the adhesive layer, we put a, a protective coating so you can walk on it. Once you lay it down, seam it. Uh, walk your bar out onto it, pour concrete to it. Uh, excellent bond to uh, concrete, um, and it's an effective uh, um, radon barrier as well. Um, map proof FBT, fully bonded, taped. Um, it is basically FPO, laminated to a non-woven polypropylene uh, fabric. You pour the concrete on there, forms a mechanical bond to the membrane. Um, and it's a, an effective radon barrier as well as a methane barrier if the uh, full tape regime is deployed. Um, it uses non-asphaltic adhesive technology and so does uh, the ALNA. Uh, over on the fluid side, uh, so those are all the sheets. This is the fluid, uh, Planacil CR1, 100% solids. Again, it's a polyurethane polyether. Uh, say that three times to a burning match. Uh, anyway. Um, Cool thing about poly uh, ethers is they don't revert when uh, in a zero slope uh, condition on the deck. Uh, so if you have ponding water, it doesn't care. It doesn't revert uh, like uh, the moisture cured urethanes do. The moisture cured urethanes, uh, they, they take water and blow it apart, create uh, carbon dioxide, and then they form a hydraulic, uh, hydraulic bond to themselves. The problem is it goes both ways. So you put water on a, a moisture cured urethane and guess what you get? you get mush, it goes backwards. Uh, usually not the best thing to have happen. So again, we know all the decks are supposed to slope the drain, but sometimes that didn't happen. Uh, so fantastic product, um, great product. Um, Technology has been out there since 2004, uh, full waterproofing applications. Uh, Mapper drain is the drainage composite. Uh, essentially we make a vertical drain for the walls and a horizontal drain for uh, like the Closet X uh, or um, any kind of concrete pour it to it on the uh, balconies. Um, we also make a third drain, it's called a TD, uh, lovingly called a trench drain, but it's really for the bottom of wall on the foundation outside the footer as a, and replaces your collection pipe. Being that it's only one inches wide, but still has the flow capabilities of basically a 12 inch perf, perf pipe. Uh, very, very highly out, out does all of the existing technology as far as the four inch and the six inch, but it's at a very low profile. So it's likelihood of being damaged is significantly reduced. So it's a very good uh, product to put on your, your uh, to specify because uh, it'll eliminate that one, uh, the number one reason why waterproofing membrane systems fail is the perf pipe and then it, the system gets bypassed or overcome. Uh, made out of polypropylene. Uh, if you've ever put uh, um, mineral spirits or lacquer thinner in a coffee cup, you'll know why. Polystyrene doesn't work very well uh, when it's exposed to those type of hydrocarbons. Polypropylene is not affected by it. That's always good if you run into that. Uh, my pay does make a complete line of accessories. Uh, that aforementioned uh, water stop is that picture with the yellow glove on the right and the guy hammering it in. Uh, the water stop doesn't care. It, uh, you know, it, it, it will seal around that, and then when that uh, nail, if that nail corrodes away and goes away, it'll seal around that too, that gap. So that's what's cool about swelling water stops or expanding water stops. Talk a little bit about MAPE. Uh, we're one of the few soup to nuts manufacturers. Um, if we're talking about meals, you start with the soup and you end with nuts, right? Uh, so start to finish. Prep materials, waterproofing materials, drain materials, water stops, deck coatings. And if you screwed the pooch and did it wrong or something happened uh, or we didn't do it, uh, we have <laughs> concrete repair products as well as injection grouts that uh, uh, can also take care of this. But please don't don't narrow my pay into that small little box of waterproofing. They, they make, uh, there's 16 divisions to uh, Montpellier. You ought to look at it on the, on the website. It's, it's pretty amazing as to uh, 
uh, what exactly this company does, and uh, they do it very, very well. So those are the products and waterproofing. Uh, just get back to our outline. So, okay, we're gonna start on the technical support. Uh, we've got a really good technical support. It usually comes in about four forms uh, of uh, uh, su uh, support. Uh, first is internally, uh, we make the data pages, brochures, guide specs. Uh, we have a each membrane system essentially has about 50 plus uh, standard CAD drawings, details available on the website, warranty forms, as well as warranties, the sample warranties. Uh, we provide that as well, as well as any new product development. We'll do some field testing. Um, or if we're going to modify an existing product, we'll do the field testing first before uh, letting it out of its cage. Um, general support in the form of uh, uh, answering the phones. We answer phones. Uh, we also uh, provide field support. Uh, we have a network of uh, uh, folks all around the country. Um, but if you want to talk to me, I'll, we can always jump on a, uh, me or the technical service manager can jump on an airplane, come to you. Uh, we provide uh, product training uh, to anybody who, who asks, um, whether it be a waterproofing contractor, architect, consultant, engineer, uh, even distributor personnel, and uh, anybody else who wants to learn about MAPE's waterproofing products, we'll train you. We'll you know, open it up, talk about it, touch it, smell it, probably not eat it, but or taste it. But you'll be able to you have a full understanding of it um, by the time we're done. Uh, warranty support, uh, we provide a, 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 we process it, we issue it, uh, and then if something unfortunately goes wrong, uh, we're there to help uh, move through and get uh, get it fixed. Uh, Precon, so this is the uh, another form, uh, one more form to go. Precon support is um, having to do with um, uh, project document review, creating those CAD details. Um, if we need to do a system recommendation, we'll do a system recommendation and provide documents for submittal purposes and doc documentation purposes. We do go to job sites. When we're at the job sites, pre-cons, be happy to do that. Sometimes we'll do job starts, do membrane review, membrane inspection, installation inspections, um, certify the substrates are correct, and if there's a problem, we're, we're around to resolve it. My favorite part is making a detail come alive. Um, so I'm, I, I chose a tile and mortar bed on waterproof concrete over an occupied space. Installation detail from uh, the TCNA, the Tile Council of North America, uh, TTMAC, the Tile, I'm sorry, the Terrazzo Tile and Marble Association of Canada. That's the reference number there. It's their standard detail and we put below it some MAPE products and provide that uh, as reference. Step one, well, hey, you know, here we go. First layer, surface prep, surface prep and prime. So we got to fix the deck, repair the deck, repair the deck with the primer. The membrane we've chosen is the mapathane, so it does require a primer, a contact adhesive. Uh, here's the uh, peel and stick uh, sheet applied membrane. The dashed line represents an overlap, side lap of two and a half inches. If the membrane, uh, uh, we, we run out of it and we have to marry it uh, end to end, it's a five inch lap. Uh, there, that uh, kind of shows that. And then since it's a peel and stick, it's ready to go for the next uh, layer, which is the drain board. We don't have to let the product set and cure. So we'll put a contact adhesive on top of the membrane and then attach the drain board. By the way, we're done. Five steps to be fully installed for waterproofing. The next is uh, the overburden. So there's the uh, uh, mortar bed, two inches reinforced. Secondary waterproofing applied on top of the uh, mortar bed. Bond coat to bond the um, tile to uh, the system. And there you got your installing your tile and grout. How fast does it go? Pretty fast. This is a standard uh, installation detail for the same one. This is what you would get from uh, uh, on a submittal if it came from uh, the waterproofing trade. Uh, it's essentially that previous detail cut in half, showing all the representative layers and all the arrows, everything uh, that you would need for an installation. So that just about wraps it up. I'd like to thank you for your attention. My hope is that this uh, presentation was uh, informational and uh, hopefully we'll start a, a conversation about primary waterproofing. Thank you. 
And thank you, John. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first, can you use a vertical drainage composite horizontally? Typically not. Uh, we don't like to pour concrete onto a, uh, a, a non-woven uh, fabric because it'll stick to concrete. And that's not exactly what we want to have as the concrete stuck to the drain board. So no, in that case, we would use a horizontal drain. The only time we'd ever use a, um, uh, a, hor a vertical drain horizontally would be if we're putting dirt on it. Oh, and it was okay. very, very, very shallow soil. Got you. Um, which side of the drainage composite should they see during the installation process? Depends on the installation. So blind side, we'll see the dimples because the fabric goes to the dirt. If we're pouring on top of it, we'll see the fabric or not the fa the woven fabric. And if we're on a wall, we'll see the fabric facing us because when, when we're installing it on a, a wall already existing, uh, the dirt is us because we're gonna actually backfill on top of that. So the fabric, will, you'll, you'll see the fabric. So the dimples will go to the membrane. Here's an interesting one. Which is the best waterproofing, sheet waterproofing or fluid applied? So my uh, pet answer to this is, uh, you know, adult diapers. Um, <laughs> it really, uh, really depends uh, on your application. <laughs> Depends on your installer, uh, whether or not your installer has the expertise to, to or has the experience in uh, sheet applied waterproofing. And uh, it depends on your time and how much time do you have, um, because each of them have their, their shortcomings and each of them have their, their best features. And I've, I, I did note a few of the best features of, of both of those two. So again, it depends on the application. <laughs> 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 well, thank you, and uh, we'll end on that note. <laughs> if there are any more questions, we'll uh, answer them via email. And uh, as I said before, you can always send questions to mapaydigital at mapay.com, and we'll be happy to answer them for you there. And uh, again, this will conclude today's Mapay Online webinar. Thank you, John, for a really great presentation, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, for taking time out of your busy days to join us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.